maybe not. Okay, how about that? Just yeah, well, it should be recording hey. now. Okay. Yes, it's good. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. I'm very happy to, to welcome Guadalupe tonight. And I have to to tell you the story of how I met uh, uh, Guadalupe. So I um uh, I went to Mexico City in April this year, and uh, I uh, wanted to go see the Anthropological Museum, the National Museum in uh, Chapultepec Park. This is in downtown Mexico City. It's probably the most famous museum in Mexico, or at least one of the ones. This is one of the ones that you should go and see there. I think there are something like 170 museums in Mexico City, so it's, <laughs> that's saying quite a bit there. And I went on one of these, uh, of these Airbnb experiences looking for someone who could uh, show me around the museum, do uh, you know, a guide because I knew there would be a lot of materials and things that I didn't know, and maybe some uh, backstory about some things. And uh, there was Guadalupe, and I signed up for a, a tour, and there was one other person on the tour, and we we went around and looked at all of these really interesting things. And she's, uh, uh, and tell me if I have this wrong, Guadalupe, but you're an expert in Mayan culture in particular. And she had quite a bit to say about the Mayans and, and all of that, and the Aztecs, of course, and, and, uh, and several of the other indigenous cultures uh, in Mexico. And we get to see some of those really uh, wonderful icons that, that if you've if seen any uh, Mexican history, you'll, you would be very familiar to, and we get to see those you know, up close. So that was, that was really interesting and, and a lot of fun. And when I started to put together this lecture series, I thought, well, maybe, Guadalupe would like to come and speak with us because she was wonderful on that tour. And so I contacted her and said, would you, would you be willing to come and speak with us? And uh, she said, yes. And by the way, do you need help getting some other people? And so uh, through her connections and contacts, we, we've been able to, to put together a whole series with wonderful people from Mexico City and, and, uh, and beyond. And, uh, and so thank you very much. And thank you for being here with us tonight. Okay. So I, before you start, I'd like to read your bio for everyone so they know a little bit about you. And then I will turn it over to you. I think tonight, last time we were together, we did this as kind of an interview. But I think tonight you're going to do it more as a lecture. If you'd like me to ask questions, I'm happy to, to join in. Or I, I can be quiet and wait until the end. And then and maybe that's easier to not interrupt the flow. So you let me know what you'd like. But uh, this, is, uh, this is Guadalupe's bio. So uh, Guadalupe Zatina Gutierrez is an anthropology professor at the Autonomous University of the State of Mexico, as well as being adjunct researcher of the Teteres de Santo Nombre Archaeological Project and La Cotepec National Institute of Anthropology and History. How did I do with that? Uh, <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Gutierrez holds a, a Bachelor of Anthropological Sciences with a specialty in archaeology and a master's of science in uh, uh, human ecology. She has a postgraduate PhD in anthropology and 23 years of experience participating in archaeological and anthropological projects with government, national, and foreign universities. She's the author of articles mm. and lectures, scientific conferences, and specializes in outreach in Mexico and abroad. She's won an honorable mention in the INAH 2012 awards. As a university professor of archaeology, she has taught courses and workshops and seminars in undergraduate and graduate degree programs. Uh, and Guadalupe is also the uh, co-founder of the Intercontinental Association for Mexican Cultural Heritage and the founder of the Social Enterprise for the Dissemination of Mexican Culture, Mexico Unearthed. So we are very lucky to have you. And again, thanks for being here tonight. And I'll turn this over to you. And please let me know if there's anything that I can do there. To help. Okay, okay, thank you so much. And first, I want to tell you thank you for inviting me. And to clarify, uh, my English is very, very far away to be perfect. So if I'm seeing, if I am seeing something is uh, impossible to understand, please stop me and tell me, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> okay, and I try to explain again. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the most remarkable examples about the, 
manifestation of the Mesoamerican art. And this is the point of view of an archaeologist and anthropologist. And is uh, I going to try to use techni technicalities, okay? So to talk about from the Mesoamerican art, the first is to talk about from the Mesoamerica, okay? Maybe one of, of these people know what is Mesoamerica. Mesoamerica first is not a geographical place. Mesoamerica is, um, is like to put together all civilizations and in the same area, all civilizations sharing different aspects of the daily life. Uh -huh. For example, talking about from the subsistence, uh, the basis of the feeding of these people in the past was the milpa. The milpa was very high technology to feed uh, the population and is the mix of the different legumes and vegetables and plants at the same time in the same ground. Okay, talking about from the architecture in almost America, uh, we had the construction of the pyramids. Uh -huh. And the second most important uh, characteristic talking about from the architecture, architecture is the construction and the stages. This means um, in the beginning, all uh, buildings was very small and later over, over time, uh, we have the reuse of different materials and grew and bigger and bigger, okay? And talking about from the religion in all this area, uh, all these people uh, took the different attributes from the nature and become a god and goddess. Uh -huh. And for example, the most important resources become a god and goddess or divinities. I mean, uh, the fire, the water, the, the corn, and so on. Uh -huh. So, but tonight, uh, let's uh, talk about from the three very remarkable examples. And the first is in the Maya area, okay, in the Yucatan Peninsula. Later, we're going to travel in chronological order, let's, uh, let's travel to the western of the Mexico. And we are going to talk about from the Mixtecos in this area. Uh -huh. And we're going to finish with the Mexicas in the center of the Mexico, Aztecas or Mexicas. And talking about from the chronology, um, let me see if I can, okay. In chronological order, they need to, to do smaller, ah, okay. In, in chronological order, we have these three civilizations. First, let's talk about from the Mayas. Later, uh, the Mayas for me and my, personal um, opinion is uh, the most chingon, the most coolest, the coolest civilization we have in Mesoamerica. And I'm saying this not only because inside of my veins runs my own blood, <laughs> because we have enough evidence, archaeological evidence about this. I mean, we have Mayas in all periods of the history in Mesoamerica. Uh -huh. The most ancient evidence of the Mayas is around the 3000 years BCE or uh, before Christ uh -huh, to the conquest. Later, we're going to talk about from the Mistecos and uh, the rise of the Mistecos is around the 900 uh, CE or uh, after Christ until the conquest, when we are talking about from the 1521. And talking about from the Mexicas, the foundation of the great Tenochtitlan, the great capital of the Aztecas or Mexicas was around the 1325 and finished again uh, with the conquest of, from the Spaniards. Uh -huh. So talking about from the, in general, which are the characteristics of the Mesoamerican art? First, we need to understood all manifestation of the art in the specific context. Uh -huh. We need to analyze every specific case in the economical, social, or ritual context. 
And in the most of the cases, we have the representation of the deities or div uh, divinities and different events, including myths, events in the myths. And in the, in the, in the list of the cases, we have different aspects of the daily life. But in this point, we need to understand that the center of the life of these people was the religion. Uh -huh. And the religion and the past must be understood like, um, like science, because uh, these allow to understand the function of the universe. Uh -huh. So this is the most important aspect in the life of everybody in Mesoamerica, the religion. And of this manifestation of the art, are specific cases of the marketing. Marketing, yes, because we have marketing all the time. All the time, the different societies want to transmit one message and sometimes this message is not real, okay? It's only marketing. So, and the most remarkable uh, manifestation of the art, we have sculptural, ceramic, historical works, ghost meeting, basketry, or better art. And now let's see the specific case of the Mayan sculpture with the case of the lid of the tomb of the uh, Pakal, the King Pakal, and in the Maya area. Huh? And a specific in the city of the Palenque and Palenque, in, pardon, in Chiapas State. So talking about of the Palenque was a very, very important city. And this uh, king wants to be completely special, completely memorable to everybody. And to do, uh, to put a tomb in a pyramid was not common in Mesoamerica. We only have very few examples. Uh, so this is a, a, a way to say to everybody, I am completely special. Uh -huh. So now let's see the tomb. Okay, here we have a representation of the, the tomb, the, the, the inner space inside of the tomb of the Pakal. Pakal was, uh, was born around the 615 and dies around 600. Uh, 83. And this tomb uh, dates uh, around uh, this uh, date. Uh -huh. But the most interesting is analyze the representation and the in the in the cap and the lid. Uh -huh. Because here we have exactly uh, we have this representation, symbolic representation, and this idea of marketing to say to everybody. I am completely special and I am, I have uh, the power, huh? Because this is very important. In Mesoamerica, when you see somebody representing a monument when public spaces, this means these people is completely a specific people and a specific date and a specific event, huh? We have no anonymous, this is very weird to have uh, anonymous examples. So when you see people represent in public spaces or monuments, it's because these people is really, really special. And in the most of the cases are the kings of the rulers. Huh? So this design in the cap on the lid of the tomb of Pakal, we have, for example, in the basis, we have the monster of the earth. And here we have Pakal sitting in the basis of the representation, symbolic representation of the Seva tree. Uh -huh. the, before the Spaniards came in Mesoamerica, we have the representation of the cross. And this cross symbolizing the Seva tree. The Seva tree was the most important and sacred tree in all this region. And represent in symbolic way, how these people understood the universe. Uh -huh. Because the cross have four different directions, cardinal points. And these uh, courses, horizontal courses, is completely Mesoamerican. 
for many years, uh, the people uh, believe we have levels in the, in the understanding of the universe of the Mesoamerican people. And no, that is a confusion. This is a reinterpretation and confusion given by the European people. Uh -huh. In Mesoamerica, uh, the universe is completely horizontal. But this is the representation we have in the, the Pakal tomb. Uh -huh. And later, we have the second uh, example. The second example is about the Mistec goldsmith. Uh -huh. We are talking about of the Western of the Mexico and we have the Mistecos in this region in Monte Alban. Monte Alban, uh, I confused the place, it's in Monte Alban. It's in Monte Alban and Monte Alban was uh, primarily uh, occupied by the or built by the Zapotecan culture. Uh -huh. and, and later the mystic arrived and conquest the Zapotecs, the Zapotecos, and reuse one of the most important tombs. And inside of this city, we, we found the most important finding about goldsmithing. This is one of the examples of the objects inside the tomb. Very, very complex and very still sided and sophisticated objects in gold. I have to say uh, the metallurgy, the use of the metals in, in Mesoamerica was not common, was not common until the post-classic. We believe um, these techniques coming from the Peru because uh, we have no uh, archaeological evidence to say these techniques uh, are completely native from Mesoamerica. Uh -huh. And the most interesting examples coming precisely from the western of the Mexico. We have the Mistecos, like the masters of the goldsmithing in gold. And with the Purépichas or Tarascos, uh, creating a lot of different tools with metals. But the masters, the chingones, with the, with the goldsmithing are absolutely the Tarascos, perdón, the Mistecos. So here we have a very, very interesting uh, example inside of the tomb. And we have different elements represented very, very uh, small scale. This, this object is very, very small, but we have a lot of details. Uh, for example, the plume, or details in jade, or decoration in the face, like um, earrings, or uh, narigueras, or different uh, jewelry, okay? So this is completely interesting. Mm, okay. Later, like um, very important uh, example, let's talk about from the feather art. In a specific, the plume of the Tetuani Moctezuma, okay? Now let's talk about from the Mexicas. Mexicas uh, was Mexica or Aztec culture, uh -huh. Aztecas or Mexicas. Now we are talking about in the center of the Mexico and let's talk about from the Tenochtitlan Tlatelolco. Uh -huh. Uh, in the middle of the lake, the Texcoco Lake. And now let's talk about from the fair art. And for example, here we have a, um, an example of representation in the, in the Florentino Codex. And here we have the people working with the, like uh, plumbers or working with the chimales or shields. The truth is, the most important, um, the most important object or material to show high status was the jade, and the second most important material to show status was the feathers. So everything in jade and everything in, in feathers are objects. The most important, okay, the most um, beautiful. And here we have an image of the 
the plume of the Tlatuani Moctezuma, of the King Moctezuma, was made in, with, with feathers of the Quetzal. The Quetzal is the national uh, bird in Guatemala. And this is all these uh, feathers coming from the tail of the Quetzal bird. So it's completely amazing, completely impressive. So we have a long story about, about how this plume was traveled from the Tenochtitlan, the great capital of the Aztecas or Mexicas, to Europe. It seems uh, Moctezuma, the king, confused um, to Hernán Cortés with a messenger or maybe their own Quetzalcoatl, the most important god in Mesoamerica. And it's not clear until now if this, uh, this plume was given like a part of the gift for, for Hernán Cortés confusing with Quetzalcoatl god. Or maybe it was part of the, of the treasure was stolen in the palace of the Moctezuma. But the most interesting is uh, when this uh, plume traveled to Europe, was changing of hand in hand, and um, was uh, lost in um, the different properties of the plume. Uh -huh. For example, here we have an, an image of the principles of the 20th century. And now we, uh, let's see some images about uh, the different birds is uh, the materials of the plume. Uh -huh. We have reports of this uh, plume have in the beginning like a nose of a bird in gold. But you know, when the Spaniards or any uh, Europeans see this uh, kind of object, for them, the most important was the gold. So this piece, like a part of the peak of the bird, disappear. Huh? And this is the original. This is the original. Now is in, in Vienna, in Austria. And the conditions are completely terrible. The truth is, it's impossible to return to Mexico uh, because the conditions are not allowed to travel anymore. <laughs> the government of Mexico tried to, to reach an agreement, but now we know this is completely impossible. So I don't know, okay, the name in, in Nahuatl, the name of this uh, piece was Quetzalpanecayotl. Okay, this is a little, a little bit to, to pronounce. And, okay, I don't know if you have questions because I, I think maybe it's possible I, I went too much faster. <laughs> maybe it's, it's true that the people can ask everything, everything one. Guadalupe, could you, sí. could you describe again on the, on the plume? So it's, it is made up of uh, quetzal feathers. That's what the green part of it is, right? And that's, sí. a, and that bird is, is the national bird of, of what country? Okay, here we have the plume and the most of the feathers and the, and the plume are quetzal, the tail, these long uh, feathers. But we have a combination of the different birds in the center of the Mexico. Uh -huh. The most interesting is the different objects, I need to, to, to put the phone on the me because the, the heart is terrible here. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> because here it is terrible, the temperature. Okay. Uh, yeah, take your time. We're, we're fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, talking about from the different characteristics. Ah, okay. The point is, the different objects of a culture express not only a social or economic conditions. The most interesting is reflect uh, the use of the natural resources around. For example, it's uh, very easy to identify the different birds and the composition of the plume. 
Uh -huh. And it's possible to know uh, in the same time, um, maybe uh, the recollection of the different objects compose the different artifacts. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. so how did the, how did the how did the plume end up uh, getting to Europe? Why is it why is it in Austria now? Okay, the story of why is in Austria? Yes. Okay. This is part of the confusion of the Hernán Cortés with Quetzalcoatl uh, God. We don't know how we have this myth, the return of Quetzalcoatl and, and the shape of the human being with white skin and, and blonde hair. Huh? So when we have the contact with these uh, two words, uh, we suppose or everything points to Moctezuma, the king, gave the plume like a part of the gift uh, because you know the most important are in jade and in feathers so the plume is completely one of the most uh, it's a masterpiece of the art so was uh, considered something really really valuable uh -huh. later this uh, plume traveled to europe and we have different uh, stops but the for the European, the most important is the gold. So when these people saw the plume, they say, oh, okay, this is only garbage. This is no, it's not valuable because only we have very small pieces of gold like this. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So uh, the most of the, of the Europeans, people say this, this is only garbage and put in, in a stock until was until 90, uh, 99, uh, 99, no, 99 century, when this plume appears in Vienna, in Austria. Uh -huh. And then the people of the Knowledge Museum take the plume and say, okay, um, what is this? Oh, maybe it's a big fun. Oh, no, 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 it's not a big fun. Oh, maybe, maybe it's a cup and put the cup. But no, no, no. Oh, oh, maybe it's a crown. Okay. But in this point, the condition of the plumes are completely terrible. So the government of Austria invests money to rescue this object. And that is the reason the government of Austria don't want to return the plume because they say this is part of the heritage of Austria now. But in Mexico, we have another, um, another objects uh, from Austria, for example, many belongings from the, from the Maximiliano of Hansburg. Huh? And at some point, the government of Mexico offered exchanging the different objects. But due to the condition, this was completely impossible. All right, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think Mr. Guadalupe? Si? I do have a question. Yeah. Um, does it, like, does uh, each feather of birds, does it represent like what class you are? Or like, if it's like, if they had an army, does it, does the, um, the feathers represent what high status or low status they have? Okay, this is very important, your question. Everything represents, or in the real life, all, everything over the head of the people represent the status, okay? Using plumes or hairstyles or hats. So when you are using a big, very big uh, plume like this, let me to show again this, are saying I am the most powerful. Uh -huh. And the different representation and sculptures, for example, sometimes we have enough space to show complete the plume because this monument is saying to everybody, I am the most powerful. Uh -huh. And for example, the people of the lower class have nothing over the head. 
So it's very, very important. When you visit Mexico and visit different museums, please analyze the representation of the people and you can read the status over the head. Thank you for that question. It's, it's completely key. Another question? So more, so more feathers, bigger feathers, and like more jewelry represented higher class. Yes. And not everybody using feathers. The feathers is only for the most, most special. I mean, the rulers, the kings, and maybe captains or royal families or people in the royal court. Uh -huh. But no, for example, mercadizers or farmers or something. Maybe plumes or maybe feathers for another uh, birds. For example, uh, when you see the quetzal feathers, the green color is the most, most important people. Okay, when you, you want to identify something really, really important, identify the green color. The green color is the key. Jade and quetzal feathers. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much. Thank you to you. Another question? I think there's some questions. There was a couple of questions that some of the other students in our class were asking inside of the chat. Yeah, and Can I can't. Can I read them? Every, yeah, would you read them? Because everything is crashed yeah. on my end. So, um, so uh, what do you see? Let me go back. David had asked, um, how did the plume become important for the Mexicans? Huh? I don't understand the question. Oh, uh, she uh, David asked, how are the plumes uh, represented like the uh, the people? Or oh yeah, I think you answered that. You you were you were talking about that. Yeah. Was there another one in the chat? Um, Ashley Muse put, why are those birds chosen to create the plume? Was it because of the bright colors? And then Lucy said, are people still funding the ongoing discovery of new artifacts in the May Mayans regions? Okay, you have to think in economical reasons of the time, the offer and demand. With something, we have a lot of something and it's very easy to get, it's for everybody. With something is uh, very, very hard to get, is only for very important people. So in this plume in a specific, with this kind of uh, feathers, choose this special birds is because these birds are not common. Uh -huh. This is completely special. Uh -huh. And is the same, for example, with the jade. The jade is no, is no native in Mesoamerica. It's was very vulnerable because it's not easy to get. Later, this uh, was the origin of different trading of exchanging routes to get the most valuable materials to, to adorn. Uh -huh. But the most interesting is you have to remember all the time, these persons have the same nature of you. I mean, we have the same uh, tendencies to, to, um, to have the most beautiful, huh? to be special. It's human nature to be special. So all the time, it's very important for the people to show to everybody, I am the most powerful, I am the most special, I am extraordinary. And this kind of objects is to satisfy this need, this human uh, natural uh, need or necessity. Mm -hmm. Is that what your question is good? Yeah, I think so. Good. <laughs> okay, okay. Give um, me more. I, I was actually also wondering, um, when the goldsmiths were making the crown, do you know how much they cost back then, if, like an estimate? of how much they cost, because I bet they cost a lot of money back then. 
or whatever they paid with. Okay, about uh, the gold was not important in the Mesoamerican uh, war, was not important in the sense we have most valuable objects. For example, use it like coin, we have the cacao seeds, for example. The gold was very beautiful metal. And if you analyze in the in Mexico museums of uh, Mesoamerican or pre-Hispanic gold, the gold is very fragile. It's very soft. It's very not important, okay? Because this is in relationship with the idea, these societies are completely machista. Uh -huh. I mean, the most important, again, I, I, I need to explain again about the use of the jade. The jade is important also because it's very heavy. So the real man needs to use this kind of object because not everybody can, can uh, use this weight object. Uh -huh. And the gold is like a paper, fragile, soft, is for women. Uh -huh. It's no, was not the best. Uh -huh. And we have a few examples in comparison, for example, with sculptures or ceramics or, or another uh, expressions of the jewelry uh, in comparison with the gold, the gold is only a compliment, was not important in, in the past, which was only a beautiful yellow metal, but was not too much important. And for example, when the Spaniards arrived to Tenochtitlan and discovered different uh, jewelry or objects with gold, they decided to stole and, and melt this uh, gold and create ingots. Uh -huh. Uh, if, um, we have um, the, the record of this event, for example, when the Spaniards go inside of the palace of the Moctezuma to sleep there and install the gold and create ingots and flee in the middle of the night with these ingots inside the closes. And, <laughs> and this is a persecution. Uh, many Spaniards die. And this is the reason, and the, and the bottom of the Texcoco Lake the archaeologists found ingots. Uh -huh. I don't know if this is the answer to your question. Yes, that would work. Okay, thank you. So uh, what was re the relationship between the Aztecs and the Mayans like? Okay, this is a very interesting question. But, uh, let's return to the image of the Mesoamerica, okay? I say uh, we have Mayas in all periods. Huh? We have this big territory. We have Mayas during the pre-classic, classic, and post-classic. Huh? And the Mexicas or Aztecas coming from the north of the Mesoamerica. And the, during the post-classic period, we're talking about 1,100 BCE after Christ. Uh -huh. These people coming from the north and later uh, to be wandering around the Texcoco Lake, settled in this area. And they conquest to everybody, everybody in Mesoamerica. I don't know if you can imagine the, the amount of people in this area. Uh -huh. But the most interesting is they try to conquest to the Mayas, all this territory, very big territory. Uh -huh. But it was completely impossible. This is another reason I say this is the most chingon, the, most, the coolest of the coolest civilization in Mesoamerica, because it was completely impossible to conquest. And the reason was because the Mayas was, um, was organized in independent cities. Uh -huh. This means if you conquest Palenque, for example, you only conquest Palenque no more cities because it's completely independent. And if you compare, for example, with the, with, uh, the empire of the Tenochtitlan, if you conquest the capital, you conquest all the territory. So it was completely impossible from the Mexicas conquest 
the Mayas. Uh -huh. But the truth is, sometimes when, when the people is not familiarized with Mesoamerica, think the different cultures was isolated and this was not so. It's, it's a, precisely the opposite. All the time we have uh, contacts between the different uh, cultures and societies and cities, and especially when we have when we have uh, exchanging or trading routes, uh -huh. and these uh, exchanging routes coming from the beginnings of the civilization in Mesoamerica, I mean from the pre-classic period. So we have contacts and influences of the different cultures each other all the time. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, the, in, in concrete, the relationship with the Mexicas, with the Mayas, were completely enemies. Mm. <laughs> all this uh, speech, all to say, are enemies. <laughs> Sorry. The, the Aztecs were, were fairly brutal in what they would do to their enemies, weren't they? <laughs> the enemies. Uh, okay. uh, can, can you hear? Can, can you hear me or not? Yes, tell me. Oh yeah, I was at, I was saying the Aztecs were fairly brutal in the way they treated their enemies. Absolutely, absolutely. It's uh, because these the Mexicas or Aztecas was completely warriors. Uh -huh. The center of the life of this civilization was the war and conquest territories. So if you are in the head of a big empire, this means you need to be completely brutal because you know, the only way to, to maintain the order in a very big territory is using the fear. So in almost America, we have like a part of the religion, for example, the use of the of the rituals, public rituals, for example, for the ball games, or sacrifices, human sacrifices. Uh -huh. But in all these cultures, in in every point of Mesoamerica, the purpose of the human sacrifices is not to do suffering the mankind, not not to to produce suffering to the people is because it's the only way to restore the order in the universe. But with the Aztecas or Mexicas, the sacrifice, human sacrifices have another purpose. And this purpose is completely political. Huh? It's great fear, it's maintain the fear, the people with fear because the fear is the perfect strategy to maintain the order. Huh? And I don't know if this answers your question. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I found it interesting that how many people were, were sacrificed and the whole, and the, the ceremony around it, it, it was, you know, it was actually very scary to, to hear about that. Yes, it's terrible. Okay, I'm going to describe how was this. Um, this uh, ritual was in the center of Tenochtitlan in front of the Templo Mayor. Uh -huh. In Templo Mayor, we have the representation of the two most important gods. We have Tlaloc and Huitzilopochtli, the war god. So the war god, the Huitzilopochtli, was the most important god because in, in the myths, uh, suppose they lead to the Mexicas to discover this place. Uh -huh. So in the rituals of the human sacrifice, we have a crowded place and you, you can uh, smell uh, the, the copal. The copal is like incense. Uh -huh. You can hear the drums playing and you're going to see a very, very long, long line of the prisoners. Because it's very important to say the Mexicas ask for tribute to everybody about everything and especially human lives. Mm. Yeah, and if I can interrupt for just a minute, you know, in, in Chavez's music, we hear the depiction of that with the Aztecs and the and the drumming and, and so on. So that's the, the connection really of, of uh, the, you know, the, the ancient culture or the culture and, and the music of, of nationalism. 
Okay, we only can support how the Mexica drums play because we have no any evidence. So we suppose maybe we have um, ethnological and ethnographic examples, uh, a continuity of the people living in the same place, but we only can suppose uh, that. Mm -hmm. But the fact is when you see somebody say, oh, this is pre-Hispanic music, please, have doubts about that because it's, it's not it's very hard to 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 say this is completely pre-Hispanic. Mm -hmm. Another question. That's good. So then, so so you have the drumming, and you have the people, the prisoners of, of war, and they are being marched to the Temple Mayar, which is in, in the actually to that location. It's the center of the historical district in Mexico City, right? And uh, today. And, uh, and so you have this ceremony that's about to be enacted and what happens? Okay. When the people is uh, in the line, in, in one moment, the, you can see five priests on top of the, of the pyramid. Uh -huh. And four coming for you and take your arms and take your legs and go up of the pyramid. And the fifth priest, the five priests have a very big uh, obsidian knife. And in very specific place in their body, a specific in, in the chest, but in the soft point between the chest and the ribs, and this uh, some point is the place where the when they're going to cut, uh -huh. and cut with the knife, take your heart, kick your body. I don't know if you see the movie Apocalypto. No, I haven't seen it. <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. Apocalypto is a movie of the Mel Gibson. Uh huh, and. This movie is about the Mayas. Oh. But the truth is everything that is seen about the human sacrifices is completely about the Mexicas. Uh -huh. I mean, this brutality and this way to, to do a bloody show because the truth is, is that is marketing. It's, it's, it's like, a, like a show because they try to maintain everybody in his own place. Uh -huh. And it's completely different with another cultures. Because like I said before, when, you, uh, when, when another civilization like Mayas or uh, Mixtecos, Zapotecos did the sacrifices, the idea is only restore the equilibrium in the universe because the most, powerful, the most powerful object or essence in the Mesoamerican world was the human blood. The mm -hmm. human blood is the, is the only way to restore this equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So what, what happens to the Aztecs? When? <laughs> in the conquest? In the yeah. conquest or? Yeah, what brings about an end to the Aztec culture or uh, the ushering in of a new culture? Okay, not only with the Aztec or Mexicas. During the conquest, all Mesoamerica had a very, very uh, bloody and very suddenly uh, process of the destruction. But the most interesting is this uh, trial of destruction brings this uh, mix of the different cultures and different aspects of the pre-Hispanic culture surviving in the, in the way of the mix. Uh -huh. So we have different levels of the conquest. We, we can say about the conquest in physical way, mental, uh, in religious way, and biological also. Uh -huh. It was very, very shocking process. And sometimes the people thought we have, why the Mayas disappear or why the Aztec disappear? No, 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 no. 
this is completely wrong. The truth is this, this civilization never disappear, only change. We have a new, a new stage of adaptation because like a living organism, these different cultures need to survive in uh -huh, and adapt to the natural and social and economical and political conditions. So this is, uh, this is the way to explain these people never disappear, only change, only was modified. It. Uh -huh. But it was very long process, very, very long process. Well, very interesting. Any other questions from anyone tonight? <clears throat> Uh, my chat isn't working, so maybe uh, you could read your your question. I saw something come up, but I'm sorry, no, things aren't working well on my end. Okay. No, I think I saw something about the Earth being flat. Maybe not. Maybe I missed it. Okay. Well, I didn't ask you what your favorite dessert is. Well, my favorite yeah. dessert okay i have to say uh my homeland is campeche i was born in this city and my favorite dessert is uh a, a special like uh the name is fraile and it's the combination of the cream with cocoa coconut oh wow and sugar Everything mm. here is about the coconut, and I really love this. This is my my weakness. <laughs> mm, that sounds wonderful. Can you help help us spell that or, or write it in the chat for us? Fraile. Yeah. Yes. It's uh, F R A um, I L E. Fraile. Okay. Fraile, and it's made out of coconut and what? Coconut with cream and like a tortilla, tortilla and the harina. How can I say harina? Tortilla de harina. <laughs> and the basis of the of the of the dessert is delicious. Oh. It's very very a lot of sugar, of course. <laughs> I know. I can't, I can't wait to try it. Well, thank you. Hey, We're yeah. We are coming up to the end of our time. Uh, and so if anyone has questions, you're, you're very welcome to ask them now. And uh, for everyone else, thank you very much for, for coming to lecture three. And we'll see you uh, next week for lecture four. Uh, we'll be talking about the Wapango and I think the area of Veracruz. So it should be a, an interesting lecture as well. Um, what, so was the keyword we, we uh, I, I, I can't pronounce it, I'm so sorry, but the keyword was her favorite dessert. Am I correct? Finally. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Guadalupe. No, thank you to you. Thank you to you. Thank you to everybody. And I, I want to apologize for my English. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I can understand some words, but uh, I, I did my best effort. You did great. And, and I can't imagine giving a lecture in a in a, a foreign language, in the second language. <laughs> I, could I could barely do it in English, you know, and, and, and I, I supposedly have been speaking that all my life. So I, uh, yeah, yeah, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, well, we have a lot of thank yous in the chat. Did she leave? <laughs> I'm not sure because sure, I can't see who's here anymore. <laughs> somebody, somebody. So cute. <laughs>
Okay, I'll be here for a few minutes. Uh, my video has kind of gone down. I don't really know who's here or, or anything, but I'll, I'll hang out. Anybody have any questions for me? Please feel free to ask. I'm seeing some chats. I think I'm missing some of them. But it is what it is. So, Professor, I have a question. So, uh, are we finished for this lecture? Yeah, that's it for this uh, one tonight. Yeah, uh, okay. So, uh, also, I have a question. Um, uh, so, there is no music for this lecture. So, we just need for synapses, just uh, uh, write something that um, about the lecture. Yeah, something that she talked about. Some uh -huh. of the. Uh, uh huh. Yeah. Just in our words, yes. Just in your own words. Uh -huh. It'll be fine. Uh -huh. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you so much. You're Have welcome. a nice uh, evening. <laughs> yeah, you too. Okay. Thank you. thank you. Bye. Seems I was having the same trouble you were having, Professor. And upon trying to force quit it through uh, my Windows task manager, it brought it back up and I can see everything now. Oh. There seems to be two of you. <laughs> Well, there's two of me because I, in the middle of it, I put it on my phone as well because I couldn't see anybody or anything. Uh, so, okay. so now you got two windows. Let me at least turn one of these off because I can't turn the other one off. Twice the knowledge. Well, <laughs> unfortunately not. <laughs> Let's see if I can, can leave that one. Okay. Okay, you guys are coming back in now. See a few of you still here. Thank you, everyone. All right, thank you for the lecture, Professor. All right, well, have a good evening. You too. We'll try this again next week. It's always a always an interesting thing. All right, thanks, Professor. Thank you for the lecture. Thank you. Have a good evening. You did